and would only say those things were sexual in nature. Some men have the trait of degeneracy. A lot of us men go through stages of immaturity and stupidity, but some men act solely on impulse like this dirty bastard here. So today's true crime story focuses on a man relatively unknown in the serial murder space. There's no Netflix documentary for him, there's no Hulu show. A man who acted on impulse, a man so stupid he would think Fleetwood Mac was a new McDonald's breakfast item. This is the disturbing case of William Clyde Gibson III. Finally, I just want to say the proceeds that I get from this channel helps me support my son. The rest I give to my mother as she deserves a life of happiness and dignity. I just want to make her proud. So help me get to 100k. Please hit subscribe. I'm nearly there. I just want to show her that I am not one of the aforementioned degenerates. William Clyde Gibson III, known as Clyde, was born on the 10th of October 1957. He was the youngest of four children born to William Jr., the foreman of a tree trimming company, and his mother Geraldine, who was a cashier at Sears. He told psychologists that he never experienced any form of abuse or neglect when he was a child, even going as far as to say that he was spoiled despite having a father who was an alcoholic and who was also combative when drunk. A friend of his, as a child, told the media after his arrest that Gibson was quiet in groups, had problems talking to people and wasn't particularly bright. He was particularly close to his mother, so much so that at the thought of going to school, he would get upset and that resulted in him staying home a lot. That's actually interesting. I feel like his mother gave him all the attention he wanted, which is strange given everything I'm about to tell you doesn't really make sense in terms of his behavior. At school, he was bullied by his fellow classmates. That was until he got bigger and was able to fight back against those who got physical. Around the same time, this started to happen in the sixth grade. He started to get in trouble for fighting, talking in class, and not following the directions of the teacher. This kind of behavior was not just saved for the schoolyard. At the age of 13, he began to drink and later that year, he was arrested for stealing a motorbike. His next door neighbor told the media that he was known for picking on other children, even shooting one in the eye with a pellet gun and always being in trouble. He held a C average. He dropped out of high school and continued to commit small crimes, like driving drunk and crashing the car at the age of 17. Two weeks after this crash, he joined the army. After basic training, he was stationed in Germany, where he trained as a mechanic and one marksman and hand grenade badges. Throughout this, he continued to drink, later telling doctors that he would add heroin, cocaine, and LSD to the mix. I mean, when you do all that, it's no wonder you eventually become a dirty bastard yourself, eh? In 1979, at the age of 22, he was arrested for stealing a card. After being caught, he was dishonorably discharged from the army due to bad conduct and was sentenced to a year in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Gibson would say that throughout his service, he was never treated for any form of mental illness despite also claiming that he tried to take his own life once by slitting his wrists. He would later go on and marry an unnamed artist. After his arrest, she would write to the media asking that her identity be kept a secret and for them to respect her privacy as friends and family were unaware of her ties to Gibson. For the first couple of years following their marriage, Gibson would sober up. But after being diagnosed with infertility, he began to drink even worse than before. I guess if you're firing blanks, I can understand you needing alcohol to make yourself feel better. He would say that the diagnosis attributed to his drug usage to the point where he would smoke marijuana like cigarettes as many as 20 joints in a day. 20 joints? Bruv, that guy has tolerance. On January the 26th, 1992, 
He backed his vehicle into a pickup truck and then sped off when a police officer stopped to check what damage had been done. With no headlights on, Gibson sped through the darkness until his escape came to an abrupt stop after crashing into another vehicle. The other driver would survive, walking away with eight broken ribs, and he would claim that his own injuries resulted in 285 stitches in his head. 285? Wow. Gibson was arrested and pleaded guilty to drunken driving, assault, wanton endangerment, and attempting to elude a police officer. Eight months later, Gibson would be charged with robbery and sexual battery after assaulting a 21-year-old woman by grabbing her and pinning her against a phone booth. As I said earlier, dirty bastard. Fondling her genital area, he tried to pull her toward a nearby garage and only stopped when she started to fight back. He retaliated by punching her in the head, grabbing her purse and running off. The woman would say in an interview, he was super aggressive, he was nasty, I knew it then. And this is the point. In that moment, he must have seen a woman making a phone call in a phone booth or something, felt an attraction towards her, but he would act, impulse, and then think. Make sense? Gibson's manager at the time wrote to the court and told him that he was a good-natured, trustworthy, and valuable employee, also stating that a good trimmer like him were a rarity. He wrote that he believed that Gibson attacked the woman for attention, saying that he needed help. This was backed up by Gibson's lawyer, telling the court, that he was potentially mentally ill and requested an evaluation. The evaluation showed that Gibson's judgment was fair to good when he wasn't under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Gibson was recorded as saying during the evaluation that when he drank heavily, it was hard to predict what he might do. Well, duh, that's what alcohol does to you. When asked what drew him to drugs and alcohol, Gibson replied that he was always depressed and they were a temporary fix to those issues. However, when pressed for more information on why he felt that way, he stated that he didn't know why he was depressed and tense all the time. And to me, this makes sense on why he turned to drugs. He can't make sense of why he feels this way, so he needed an escape, a temporary one, like he said. The psychologist reported that Gibson likes to project responsibility onto alcohol and drugs for his actions instead of taking responsibility for what he did. It was also noted that he had an IQ of 79, borderline range for intelligence, and that Gibson often smiled while talking about distressing or sad events. However, despite all of this, there was no sign that Gibson was suffering from any significant psychiatric problems and was competent to stand court. In other words, he was just dumb as fuck. Claiming that he was too drunk at the time of the crime, he entered an Alfred plea and was sentenced to seven years in prison for sexual abuse and for the earlier vehicular assault. Following his conviction, his wife divorced him. Once incarcerated at the Luther Luckett Correctional Complex, Gibson was assigned to the Sex Offender Treatment Program, but due to his inability to admit to his crimes, he was deemed ineligible. Throughout his incarceration, he mostly stayed out of trouble, earning an associate's degree in art from Lindsay Wilson College. Following an altercation with another inmate who was running his mouth, Gibson was placed in segregation for 15 days. This was unusual for him and he confided in the prison psychologist, telling them that in his entire life, he had only been in a total of six fights and he liked to avoid them because the pain hurt. An assessment in 1996 found that Gibson was vulnerable to poor judgment and disorganization and that he seemed to be experiencing feelings of confusion, loneliness and hopelessness along with fears of losing control. Despite this, this prison psychologist made the evaluation that Gibson was a low risk in terms of offending again sexually. On the 5th of April, Gibson was freed on the provision that he be listed on the Indiana Sex and Violent Offender Registry. Upon his release, Gibson moved back 
to southern Indiana and started living with his parents. A few months after his release, he met Kelly Bailey while they were working together as Squire Boone Cavins. She knew that he served some time in prison, but he never told her why, telling her that she did not want to know. Good move, good move. But this relationship ended in 2000 after Gibson once again started to use drugs heavily. Kelly Bailey told the media following Gibson's arrest that the breakup came after he assaulted her. She had been delivering newspapers when he suddenly appeared and blocked her car in. Next thing she knew, he was hitting her and trying to knock her out. He then took her keys and fled the scene. She reported the incident to the police who noted that her lips looked swollen and they told her that she would be better off reporting the incident to Floyd County's prosecutor's office. But then she was told that nothing could be done. And around this time, Gibson tried his hand at being a car thief. On June the 29th, 2001, he drove to the home of Danny Mann, wanting to test drive his Harley Davidson that man was selling. Gibson hopped on but never returned with the motorbike. He was later found at Mix Bar in Jeffersonville and sentenced to three years in prison. However, he was allowed to serve part of it at Madison State Hospital to be treated for drug and alcohol addiction. During his time, there he admitted that he was spending $2,000 a week on alcohol and cocaine and confessed that he liked drinking more than anything. During his four month stay, staff said he was indifferent to treatment and never once conceded that he had an addiction. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and he was prescribed Seroquel. By the end of his stay, they reported that there was no sign of anything that would allow them to suspect he was a danger to others and after giving him two weeks worth of Seroquel, he was returned to prison where he was released into the community four days later on March the 12th, 2002. In early October 2002, Gibson met Karen. Originally from Port Orange, Florida, where she worked as a beautician, she was visiting a boyfriend and was there for less than a week when she asked family for help buying a bus ticket back home. She had come to Jeffersonville to visit her boyfriend but had recently started fighting a lot and she had enough of it. While requesting the bus ticket, she told her family that she was okay and that a nice man was buying her drinks at the bar, hoping that would be enough to reassure them that she was safe. Both she and Gibson bar hopped for a little while before going to an apartment complex in New Albany. There, they argued about some prescription medication that Karen accused Gibson of stealing. Angered Gibson, he hit Karen in the face multiple times before taking out his pocket knife and inserting it into her throat repeatedly. He then took her body to Clarksville where he disposed of it. And I think I'm seeing a pattern where he seems he's okay, but the moment he starts drinking, the moment he starts taking drugs, he takes his behavior to a whole new level. A degenerate, as I said earlier. Days later, on his 45th birthday, he got a tattoo on his lower right arm with the date of the murder and a knife. Three weeks later, Gibson would find himself incarcerated once again on charges of drunk driving a stolen car. After going through four days of withdrawal, he was evaluated by the jail psychiatrist who reported that Gibson denied any feelings of being suicidal or homicidal ideation of violence. He did complain though of frequent headaches, stomach aches, insomnia and hypochondriasis. I don't know if I said that correctly but all of that seems like drug withdrawal symptoms. And it was concluded that he had mild anxiety as well as showed signs of antisocial behaviour but overall showed signs of sanity. In May 2003, Gibson tried to sue the prison authorities, claiming that they did not give him access to his prescription medications, but this suit was thrown out. Three months after her life was taken, Karen's body was found near the Ohio River in Clarksville. Despite being badly decomposed, the FBI was able to identify her through a thumbprint. Karen herself, in the year 2000, was arrested and then convicted for manufacturing, selling and delivering drugs and was sentenced to 13 months. She had only been free for 6 months at the time of her death. No connection to Gibson regarding the murder would be made until 2012. 
dirty bastard nearly got away with it. Gibson's criminal life did not stop. In February 2006, he was drinking in a bar with Robin Mayfield. She would tell media that he came into the bar a lot, drank Bud Light and was always friendly. After going to the restroom, she found that her purse had disappeared along with it, Gibson. She tracked him down with the help of her husband and once they had found him, contacted the police. He was arrested and the car was discovered to be stolen. This guy's playing Grand Theft Auto in real life, eh? This incident resulted in him being sentenced to three years in jail and he was released around the 4th of July 2009. Following his release, he got a job at CNC Hardwood Flooring. He was described as a diligent worker and his friends and neighbours described him as friendly throughout. He started to attend the local non-denominational church, made paper mache figures and started to care for his sick mother. However, while these people saw in him a positive light, people in the bars he frequented thought otherwise, seeing him as strange. On a few occasions, he did ask women to come back to his place with varying success. Following his mother's admittance to a nursing home, Gibson stopped attending church altogether. When she passed away less than six months later, neighbours commented on the effect that it had on Gibson, especially once he stopped talking to them. On the 24th of March 2012, Gibson met Stephanie Marie Kirk at the Uptown Bar in New Albany. By the time that Gibson met her, Stephanie had already been dealt a number of blows. Her mother had died the October before after contracting spinal meningitis and becoming bedridden for nine years. She had married in her late twenties, but the marriage only lasted six months. She had a child, but she became a single mother after the father of the child left. After breaking her back, she fell into depression that made it so she would really leave her room, which resulted in her father taking care of her child. She had only just started to go out again on the night that she disappeared. Gibson offered to take Stephanie for a motorcycle ride. They spent the day doing drugs and after returning to Gibson's house, they began to argue over some pills. Gibson then proceeded to choke Stephanie with his bare hands. Following her death, Gibson continued to defile Stephanie by sexually assaulting her body and breaking her back. She was then dragged to Gibson's garage where she stayed for two days before he buried her in a hole near his back porch. During his trial, police chief Ken Fudge would testify that Stephanie had been placed into the hole and twisted in order to fit. Less than a month later, on the 18th of April 2012, Christine Whites, a 75-year-old friend of his mother's, dropped by to visit Gibson. She had supported Gibson a lot in his life and often gave him money and came by to make sure he's doing okay. In return, Gibson bound her in duct tape and assaulted the elderly woman before strangling her after she begged for her life. Once dead, he mutilated her corpse by cutting off her breasts with a kitchen knife before leaving her body in the garage surrounded by garbage bags. Gibson did not get the same chance to dispose of Christine's body as he did for his previous murders. The day after Christine's murder, his sisters came round to talk about the estate as it was being divided. After checking the garage, they discovered Christine's body and the police were immediately called. Gibson would not be arrested until later that day, except it would be originally on a drunk driving charge after he was found driving Christine's car. Five days later, he would be charged with her murder after confessing to police. This would start the stop and start confessions from Gibson regarding his murders, giving police a few days between each confession. He started with Karen's murder and then a few days later led police to where he had buried Stephanie in his backyard. Less than a month following his last confession, Gibson was charged with Stephanie's murder and the prosecutors announced that they would be seeking the death penalty for all three murders. During his trial for Christine's murder, an interview was presented where Gibson told police that an evil had overcome him and forced him to commit murder. Yeah, it's probably that Jack Daniels or Grey Goose you've been drinking, you muppet. They presented a man who had planned their act of murder, labelling it as one of the most gruesome cases that had been tried. 
It was a contrast to what the defence was presenting to the court, showing that Gibson was a drunk who was still mourning his mother. He had no intention of taking the life of Christine, instead all he wanted to do was have sex with her, but when he was denied, he flew into a rage. After five days of testimony, where many graphic images were shown, he was found guilty for the murder of Christine Whitis. A month later, he was sentenced to death, to which he told the judge that it was no big deal and that he deserved what he was getting. Following Christine's trial, he changed his plea in the Karen trial and decided to plead guilty. As part of the deal, any of the evidence that was used in the Karen case could no longer be used in follow-up trials. Around this time, Gibson had a tattoo done on the back of his head that said death row times three, as in Gibson the third, death row the third. Justice Susan Orth believed that the tattoo was caused issues with the jury in his final murder case and passed a court order where prison officials were not allowed to shave his head so that the tattoo could not be seen during court proceedings. In his final trial, Gibson shocked everyone where he pleaded guilty and gave up his right to be tried in front of a jury. Despite this, the prosecution pushed for another death sentence, believing that how Stephanie had been treated gave enough aggravating factors to allow it. And you guys have seen me make videos before, I don't know how I feel about the death penalty, but when you do that to someone, jail does not seem enough. On August the 15th, 2014, Gibson was sentenced to death once more, with Justice Orth stating that it was the only appropriate sentence given the brutality of the killing. Since his sentencing, Gibson has appealed his death sentences, stating that there were mitigating circumstances surrounding the death of Stephanie Kirk. Again, Lord Jack and Mr. Daniels is not an excuse. All appeals were rejected and the Indiana Supreme Court reaffirmed all the convictions that had he had been sentenced for. He has taken part in the documentary Inside Death Row, hosted by Trevor McDonald and has been interviewed by several podcasts. During these interviews, he had confessed to an additional 30 murders across multiple states. I wouldn't put it past him to be fair. While also claiming that he has sexually abused the corpse and cannibalized some of them as well. Among them, he claimed to have murdered Elizabeth Bannister. And on the 19th of January 2000, Elizabeth had a knife inserted in her in her apartment, but despite the confession, Gibson has not been confirmed to be the one who killed her. Gibson is still on death row with no date yet set. And this is why earlier I used words like degenerate, dirty bastard, immature, stupid. I don't think this guy was sinister. Like, like, if you look at someone like Jeffrey Dahmer, if you look at people like Ted Bundy, they were born with evil. I think this guy took drugs and then completely acted out. It doesn't seem he was a victim of any child abuse. Sure, his father may have been somewhat of an alcoholic and maybe that's what validated his behavior. But it's clear he loved his mother and that she gave him everything she could. To me, his upbringing was completely fine and he just had a few screws loose, particularly when he took drugs. There's no excuses, there's no sympathy, he's a fucking moron, again for thinking Fleetwood Mac is a new burger at McDonald's. Either way, the death sentence seems appropriate, but then again, I don't know how I feel about the death sentence. So why don't you guys comment, tell me what you think.